Chapter 16 The Obedience of Authority With great diffidence I will set down what appears to me one of the most fundamental, yet forgotten, principles of social well-being. The principle is drawn from two quotations from St. Thomas Aquinas. He says, It is impossible for the common will to be well unless its citizens are good, at least those citizens on whom rests the government. But it is sufficient for the common will that others should have goodness enough to obey the command of their governors. The other quotation is, a man is, a man is bound to obey the secular powers insofar as the order of justice requires, and therefore, a, if these secular powers have a usurped and not a just authority, or b, if they command what is lawful, these subjects are not bound to obey them except by accident in order to avoid scandal. 1. From the second of these quotations, it is seen that the sin of the subject is neither so great nor so dangerous as the sin of authority as authority, provided that the subjects have sufficient obedience to obey with external obedience. The necessary minimum of all human commonalities is secured. Their internal attitude towards things in general or towards authority, is not a grave menace to any but themselves. 2. It is otherwise with those who are in authority. In so far as these are superiors and not subjects, they are bound to obey and command rather than to follow and obey. For this reason, their personal lack of virtue is likely to have its effect on the commonweal. A spendthrift or a sensual king may mean the ruin of his people. The amours of Henry the Eighth lost the Blessed Virgin Mary her dowry. If, as Plato suggests, the four cardinal virtues, prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance, are as necessary for the state as for the citizen of the state, when they are especially <laughs> then they are especially necessary for those who have the authority in the state, the personal and still more the official sins of authority are much greater menace to the state than the personal or even the official sins of the citizens. From this it would appear that if the ills of the commonweal seem critical and almost irredeemable, the likelihood is that authority is yielding to some personal or official sins. 3. The second principle of St. Thomas introduces us to rightful and wrongful authority, rightful and unrightful commands. As only the supreme authority of God is infinite power, guided by the infinite wisdom and exercised by infinite love, in other words, as only God's authority is self-limited, all other authority must be limited by another person or by a law. Some higher person or law must authorize and control all created authority within the individual or collective. No authority is right if it has not been chosen or appointed and authorized by the will of someone in higher authority. No command of authority is rightful unless commanded or authorized by the will, explicit or, tax, ta, explicit or tacit, of some ultimate person or law. 4. 
From the following the momentous principle, which we may enunciate thus, no authority has the right to command, unless in commanding it is itself obeying. In other words, authority can command obedience only when it's an act of command is an act of obedience. This obedience of authority is perhaps wider than the obedience of the subject, because as St. Thomas suggests, the common weal is not greatly hurt where the citizens have at least sufficient obedience to obey those persons who have authority over them. But these persons who have authority in the commonwealth have a duty not merely to persons but to laws. They must know and keep the laws which govern themselves or safeguard the rights of their subjects. All this requires an attitude of obedience which is the most hero heroic because it seems to be wholly self-determined and self-controlled. 5. But it may be urged that this is very dangerous doctrine to preach, seeing that much of the authority in the world and many of the commands are unrightful. The subjects, therefore, are largely absolved from the duty of obedience. But any public preaching of such a doctrine would mean the total overthrow of both of obedience and authority. The answer to this difficulty will serve to bring into clearer light the doctrine it is meant to disprove. This answer is found in the very doctrine of St. Thomas, that even an off that even an unlawful authority or the unlawful command of a lawful authority must sometimes be obeyed in order to avoid scandal. In other words, even when the citizens of the commonwealth have no duty or direct obedience to an unlawful authority or an unlawful command, yet indirect obedience may be due to the commonwealth. 6. From this, again, it follows that authority may have no right to command what the subject has the duty to obey. Or, again, authority may be wrong in the commanding what the subject would be wrong in disobeying. Or, again, the subject may sometimes have the duty to obey even when authority has no right to command. Or, again, it does not follow that, because the subject has the duty to obey, therefore authority has the right to command. These principles rest on the further principle, which we have already proved, that the laws and commands of any person in authority have a right to obedience only when they themselves are in obedience to some higher person or law. 7. We greatly wonder if the various authorities in the world of today are stating their duties, even their rights, in, in terms of obedience. Is Westminster greatly troubled to be wise in seeking out the will of God or in listening to that law of ethics which can be disregarded by nations only under penalty of national debt? 8. Many evils are now militant and indeed for the moment triumphant in the world. Even those who should, be, who should obey and of those who should command. In other words, the capital evil of a world in extremis are the disobedience to authority and, to, and the disobedience of authority. But the greater evil of the two is the disobedience of authority.
Chapter 17 The Order of Friars Preachers It may well be questioned whether the cleric, Dominic Guzman, has ever been equaled as a clerical reformer. Perhaps his greatest reform and greatest work was the order which he had left in being at his death in A.D. 1221. Something of the genius of this father of geniuses may be seen in the astounding fact that he organized his order in six years. That his master organized his church in three years will always remain one of the greatest proof of his godhead. St. Dominic, in this as in much else, followed his master with bewildering fidelity. Moreover, like his master, he left no written rule. He did not consign his thoughts to dead parchment. He stamped them magisterially on a group of living minds and hearts to whom was committed the trust of carrying these thoughts intact through the centuries. It was surely one of the greatest proofs of the Godhead of Jesus Christ that in a short three years he was able to affix forever on the minds of fishermen the transcendent ideas which have made the Catholic Church the chief phenomenon of every subsequent charity. St. Dominic was so, frankly, of his century, that so humbly self diffident in matters of detail, that he legislated for all peoples, in all time, not by a book, but by a chapter or parliament of his fellow friars. In this, again, he followed faithfully the Master Who, though the word he left no new Bible, but an ecclesia, or society of fellow men. The order of friars whom Dominic chose were given a name chosen by a pope. When Innocent III addressed St. Dominic and his friars as friars' preachers, a new thing had been created in the church. The office of preaching, which had been hitherto officially committed to bishops, was now extended to priests, with the duty of scattering the word broadcast on the fallow field of the Western Church. No cleric could have chosen such a title either for others or for himself. The name of preacher could be granted only by the Supreme Pontiff, who had authority under the Divine Commission to teach all nations unto the consummation of the world. The Church of St. Dominic's Day was in danger, not th through lack of good men, but through lack of apostles. St. Dominic, having been from his earliest childhood a cleric amongst clerics, instructed in all things of doctrine and liturgy, could not fail to realize the profound truth of the words, Instruct thy son, and he shall refresh thee, and give delight to thy soul. When prophecy shall fail, the people shall be scattered abroad. Proverbs 29, 17, 18 he felt that the church was is visible. He felt that the church is visible not, not so much by one of its four notes as in all four. To be seen, it must not be merely apostolic, and Catholic, it must also be apostolic. To insist on this fact was to challenge the opposition even of those in whom the note of holiness was most manifest. A few centuries have ever witnessed a more remarkable development that the external liturgical sanctity which made the monasteries of the 12th and 13th centuries homes of almost laus perennis. Unending prayer. 
It needed courage of an uncommon degree to challenge this official holiness, as being, by its all its excesses, by its excesses, a hindrance to the work of harvesting souls. St. Dominic's ecclesiastical training and even his diplomatic training enabled him to bring back the apostolic life to its old supremacy in the church without creating, for the most part, of any serious opposition. What befell his idea after his death is a vexed historical and ecclesiastical problem. St. Dominic's order of friars' preachers was based on two principles. The first was that knowledge is good and ignorance evil. Knowledge can only accidentally become evil, and ignorance can only accidentally become good. Moreover, though, we are taught to adore God's attribute of humility and even of simplicity. A child of St. Dominic and a brother of St. Thomas denies that we have yet been asked to adore the living, the divine ignorance. The second principle of St. Dominic's ap apostolate The second principle of St. Dominic's apostolate was that, psychologically, the first dealings of God with the adult human soul are an illumination of the mind. This principle has been formulated by the schoolmen. Nil amatur quin prius cognoscatur. Nothing is loved till it is known. The first need of the apostolic church is for apostles, who will advertise the human mind of the good tidings of great joy. So clearly was this master thought of the soul of Dominic, that six short years impressed it indelibly on the mind of St. Dominic's children. From him they soon learned that as truth, with its appeal to the intelligence, is not, is the soul's first need, and as intelligence is not distributed according to any social or economic classification, the order of preachers must appeal to human intelligence as such. That appeal reached the aristocracy of thinkers in the Summa of St. Thomas Aquinas, which was the official law of the Church, has canonized these in words. Philosophae rationalis ac theologiae studia et alumnorum in his disciplinis institutionem. Professores omnino pertracet ad Angelici Doctoris Rationem Doctrinem et Principa Iaci Santi Teniant. If the children of St. Dominic provide the aristocracy of thought with the strong meats of the Summa, the manifold democracy of the Church was given the milk of the Rosary. Pope Benedict XV, in his recent encyclical, Fausto Appetente, has recalled to the Universal Church how deeply the Queen of Heaven loved her most devoted servant, that is, St. Dominic, may easily be seen from this that she employed him to teach the most holy rosary to the church, the bride of her son. Only after careful examination would the ordinary mind discover in the rosary an appeal to the intelligence of the simplest Catholic. Indeed, so simple does the rosary appear that, far from seeming to be an intelligible thing, 
It seems to be only a senseless gabble. Yet its recitation is at once such a union of vocal and mental prayer as to appear to other credits, too intellectual. Moreover, it is Moreover, it still remains the unique prayer of the Church, which impresses on the minds and the hearts of even the most unlettered the stigmata of Christ's life and death and life after death. A devotion to God's noble creation, human intelligence, was but another name for devotion to truth. St. Dominic left to his children a crusader devotion to truth, no matter under what disguises or with what alloy of error truth might be found. If a martyr is, etymologically and historically, a witness to truth, no man is near martyrdom than he who has taken truth-telling as his craft. No wonder that in one century alone some ten thousand of St. Dominic's children won the martyr's crown. Again, few groups of men, or even of churchmen, have toiled as St. Dominic's children have toiled in the hard ways of reuniting Christendom. A son of St. Dominic has left on the record, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they may be wounded by both sides. Yet in every serious effort to bring back the other sheep to the one fold, some child of St. Dominic has been found. A love of truth has been the spring of that passionate zeal for... A love of truth has been the spring of that passionate zeal for social rightness, which has given us Savonarola and Las Casas. These men were not temperamentally lovers of reform, still less of revolution. They were, above all else, children of St. Dominic, who, after having caught some of his devotion to truth, essayed in the heart task of applying it to the social injustice which had hardened it into a pharisaical tradition. If not every action of these passionate lovers of social right and truth is beyond criticism, but is but to say that human virtue, even when heroic, is compatible with slight momentary sin. But their example in the lurid years which ushered in the rending of the seamless garment of Western Christianity reminds St. Dominic the seamless garment of Western Christianity reminds St. Dominic's children of today that at risk of scorn or death the sinking world must again be saved by men dedicated to truth. Lastly, the mystical life which is essentially concerned with the contemplation of this truth has flourished amidst the do- flourish amidst St. Dominic's children but it has grown up in harmony with the doctrine of St. Thomas that, here on earth, the most perfect form of living is not the contemplative, but the apostolic life. The essence of Dominican mysticism is in St. Catherine quitting her cell in Siena for the harvest field of the church in ruins, and keeping only a little cell in her heart. Or again, it is in Blessed Henry Suso, leaving the vision of Jesus in the chapter house, to help Jesus in the person of a beggar at the door. Or again, it is in the poet-author of the 
Panje Lingua, dictating philis- theological truth to the and four secretaries, but most of all it was in the master of all these mystics, whose life was summed up gnomely by his fellow friars. God has his nights, man his days. Chapter 18 The Friar Preachers at Oxford When the young Spaniard, William of Montferrat, had met his fellow countryman, Dominic Guzman, at the house of Cardinal Ugolini Conte, afterwards Pope Gregory the Ninth had taken to love him. He talked over a plan of life with Europe's most experienced apostle. He tells his own sworn witness after his master's death, and tells the story. It seemed to me that brothers... Dominic was holier than anyone I had ever saw, although I have talked with many holy men. Moreover, it seemed to me that he was the greatest lover of man's salvation I ever saw. That same year I went to Paris to learn theology, because first I had promised and agreed with him that after I had learned theology for two years, and he had settled his brethren in the order, we should both go to convert the pagans in Persia and other parts of the Southland. The spirit that sent a little group of friars preachers to Oxford on Sunday, August 15th, 1221, is in this story of the young man who the Apostle of the West was training to be an Apostle of the South. Surely a new spirit was abroad when the man who was wearing himself out in the harvest field of European Europe prepared his follower for work amongst the pagans by sending him to the most renowned university in the world, to prepare an apostle for the foreign missions by giving him the best university education available is not without its challenge to the apostles of today. It is characteristic of the medieval love of anonymity that we know, neither the name or nationality of the little band of friars preachers who entered England's most famous university with apostolic designs for the conversion of England. St. Dominic, who had himself planned the enterprise and chosen a band of adventurers, had made choice of Oxford with something like prophetic insight. Years of apostleship at Languedoc had shown him how a people with tradition of faith reaching back through centuries could spiritually die through the lack of teaching, as the sturdiest tree will sometimes wither through the one prolonged drought. Whatever may be said of the 14th and 15th century, it seems undeniable that the 12th and early 13th centuries were not conspicuous for the learning of the clergy or for the plentifulness of the spoken word of God. To those of us who are accustomed to the modern... My, the modern minute organization of ecclesiastical studies, which last for some years... The clerical education of the 12th and early 13th centuries outside the universities would seem of the scantiest. To raise the level of priestly education, and thereby to raise the level of parochial education, St. Dominic's saw to be the main defense against the oncoming Reformation. Oxford may be proud of having probably given the friar preachers 
their first teacher. At Toulouse, when St. Dominic took his first six friars to hear theology, the professor was known no other than the Englishman Alexander Stravensby, late professor of theology at Bologna. Stavensby, consecrated by Honorius III, Bishop of Lichfield, was one of that group of great prelates who welcomed the new spirit brought into the land by the children of St. Dominic. These men included Langton, St. Edmund of Canterbury, St. Richard of Chichester, St. Thomas of Hereford. If we are right in assuming that the Ancrin Rilwi is due to one of the first and greatest of the Oxford Friar preachers, Robert Bacon, it is evident that a spirit of scholarly asceticism and mysticism began to radiate from the great English university. Moreover, if with Edmund Bishop we accept the St. Edmund of Abingdon and not St. Osmond as the mastermind that definitely remodeled the Sarum Rite, we are probably not far from the truth in associating St. Edmund's work with the liturgical revival, which has left us the right of the friar preachers. The coming of the friars preachers to Oxford began the growth of that collegiate system, which still gives the two great English universities a place apart. Moreover, the example of the friars, who offered to their novices the advantage of university education, was quickly followed by the Benedictines of South and North, the Carmelites, and later by the Cistercians. John of St. Giles <clears throat> John of St. Giles doctor, theologian, professor at Paris, having become a friar, was afterwards sent to Oxford. So great was his reputation that he was allowed to add a second chair to theology. A second chair of theology. These two chairs were filled by men who made the name of England famous throughout Europe. Robert Bacon, Fishacre, Simon Beauville, Kilwardby, Bromyard, and Trivet. Claypole and Hotham are names of note at a time when the level of English theology was at its highest. What happened in the 16th century to the friars has taught us the stern duty of reviewing what happened in the 13th Nowhere more than in England were the friars' preachers favored by the king and nobles. It is the penalty of scholarship in every age to be pressed into the service of mediocrity, and sometimes even of mammon. All was not well with the church when the children of the apostate apostle who had left a diplomatic for an apostolic career were forced by an unkindly obedience to be the friends and even the messengers of kings a fraternity dedicated to yet largely dependent on doles from a sovereign and especially from a tudor is not beyond sight of Cilia or Charybdis it is, no doubt, an exaggeration, but only the exaggeration of a truth to say that the English friars of the 13th century rested their material basis on the crown and the peerage. But there is only the unexaggerated truth in recording that the breath of a tutor 
sovereign in the 16th century, unmade within a year, what three centuries had brought to mat maturity. During the three centuries that passed between the coming of the friars to Oxford and their suppression by Henry VIII, the spirit of St. Dominic had won countless victories. The man who had been called the first minister of education was living too manifestly in his children not to instruct many unto the adventure of instructing the world in righteousness. English children of St. Dominic had a zeal, not untempered with pity, for the Jews were pioneers in the instruction of women, even of devout women, as witnessed by the Ancrin Rilwi, were on fire to spread the good news even by the stage, as when they fostered the mystery plays, were devoted to the task of raising the level of clerical scholarships, as many be traced in every act of their long life at Oxford. Yet it may have befallen them as some students of their founder's life think that it befell him. To most Catholic historians, it had seemed that St. Dominic's apostolate to the Albigensians was such a success that he coveted to apply elsewhere in methods which had proved efficacious in Languedoc. To some of us, his children, he seems, are on the contrary to have failed, and to have realized his failure most when the thing he detested most had come to pass, and the dogs of war had been unleashed to supplant the dogs of the Lord. Having failed to convert Languedoc, he felt he must convert the world. His schemes of victory grew greater by his defeats. There are still some of his children, perhaps even here in England, who are only lifted up to hope by the thought that this little band of thirteen friar preachers who brought into Oxford the fire they had borrowed from their father's torch, failed in their effort to enkindle the land. The England, which sank so speedily in the 16th century, can only be excused of its betrayal by the words, they knew not what they did. But this plea of ignorance, which is probably valid and therefore satisfactory, must mean that by some happening, whether culpable or inculpable, we know not, God knows, the message of St. Dominic to Oxford and to England had failed. To men of desires, failures can be lessons. For them, defeats are not absolute, but relative. The children of the man who dreamed of converting the world when he had failed to convert a corner of one kingdom in one continent, think to serve him with renewed loyalty by a new effort to change victory, to change vi defeat, to change defeat into victory in the home of lost causes. Chapter 19. Liberal Catholicism. The uh, late, <clears throat> the late Bishop Bronlow, in forwarding to his clergy the, quote, joint pastoral of the English hierarchy on liberal Catholicism, unquote, added the following words. Is it possible that the term liberal Catholic may be misunderstood by some and be supposed to be equivalent to Catholic liberal, and the pastoral may thus be supposed to strike at Catholics who are liberal in politics, 
Nothing could be further from the minds of the bishops, for the Catholic Church has among her most faithful children persons of every political party, and there are Catholic liberals who are quite as loyal and devout members of the Church as Catholic conservatives. There is a propensity in human nature which prompts us to apply ecclesiastic uh, censures to other people. Instead of taking the warnings home to ourselves, the faithful cannot be too much on their guard against imbibing the poison of liberal Catholicism, but they should be equally careful to abstain from stigmatizing others as liberal Catholics, who may be as loyal to the Church as themselves. January 1st. 1901 The wise world The wise words of a wise prelate are but a reminder that nowhere more than in ecclesiastical politics and doctrine do words prove themselves in the veils of thought in saying that must be said on the present subject, the writer must trust that his readers will go beyond the spoken word to the unspoken thought, and even beyond the thought to the thing if real ambiguity is to be avoided. For on a subject surrounded by undefined frontiers and teeming with unsettled terminology, a writer could hope to avoid ambiguities only by leaving the realm of realities for that of intellectual logarithms, so that though I shall not hope, I shall expect to be somewhat obscure, while still expecting and hoping to leave the matter a little less obscure than before. Thus I shall ask you to allow me to condemn once and for all whatever we find ourselves obliged to condemn by the joint pastoral. Yet I need not add that we are not therefore obliged to condemn the whole of liberal Catholicism merely because we are obliged to condemn it as a whole. Nor are we, therefore, to anathematize the thing because the word is suspect. Have we not heard warm denunciations of the phrase Catholic Socialism? Yet in point of fact, the Church in her relations to religious orders not only approved but favors a form of socialism, and not only socialism, but communism. Thus they may be, and the joint pastoral says there is, in ecclesiastical manners, a definite intellectual or political atmosphere known as liberal Catholicism. This is indeed reprehensible, and yet a certain tone of liberalism amongst Catholics is allowable in theory, and wise in practice. It may help us to clear the matter in hand if we begin by distinguishing two spheres of liberalism, such as the speculative and the practical, the sphere of thought and the sphere of action, the sphere of culture and the sphere of politics. A man may be liberal in one and a reactionary in the other. Thinkers are not necessarily statesmen. Nor are there many prime ministers who could write or perhaps appreciate the foundations of belief. In ecclesiastical affairs, a Catholic may be liberal to excess in matters of thought, and medieval beyond endurance in matters of policy. Yet again, boldness in ecclesiastical policy is not necessarily the outcome of originality in thought. A safe secretary of the index 
might play havoc with the propaganda. A broad-minded canon penitentiary might almost strangle the holy office. St. Thomas Aquinas was never elected prior. St. Gregory and St. Leo are the only doctors to wear the tiara. Plato's ideal of statesmen philosophers viewed historically it has remained one of the most foolish dreams of one of the wisest men. So far removed is his sphere indeed from the sphere of thought. Another distinction is of hardly less practical importance. Liberal Catholics of the exaggerated type are not confined to the laity, just as it is naive anthropomorphism that adjusts the categories of the church and the world by identifying the church with clerics and the world with laics, or with reigning dynasty, so it is the same immature thinking that identifies liberalism with the lay minds and conservatism with the clerical. For although it may be true to say that somewhat indefinite thing, the world cannot flow into the mere abstract church. Still, our blessed Lord's own gracious parables lead us to expect tears in the broad concrete field and fruitless branches on the wide-spreading concrete tree of the church. False liberalism is not a parasite of the mere lay mind. It has no prejudices against clerics. Indeed, if we take the heresiarchs such as Arius, Nestorius, Eutyches, and the rest to be classical examples of the liberalism we would condemn, it is regrettable to find that they are not laymen. Most of the wrong thinking from which the church has suffered has come from clerics. And, as a class, we are tolerable to our master, because in spite of the grievous hurt we have done, he has commissioned us to be the salt of the earth. The very greatness of our missions and our powers has brought about the evil we have wrought. For all power, wherever found, is power for evil as well as for good. And the greater the power, the greater the evil. A definition of liberal Catholicism, either of the sound or unsound type, will hardly be expected from one to whom, in both of its forms, it appears rather as an attitude than an opinion. To the true liberal Catholic, False liberalism is something a little less intolerable than heresy, and a little more dangerous than schism. For, as the Ancrin will really observes, quote, a, fo a foe that seems a friend is a traitor beyond all traitors, close quote. And it not sent seldom happens that the severe sentence passed by the true liberal upon false liberalism is passed in turn upon the true liberal by those who repudiate both the name and the reality of liberalism. Liberalism is sometimes so defined as to be synonymous with that definite mentality, to quote a phrase of Fonce Grieve, Fonce Grieve, which measures all intellectual propositions or statements, whether dogmas or scientific conclusions, by the principles and standards of experience. So used, liberalism becomes identical with what the Vatican Council has called rationalism. 
Undoubtedly, there is some infiltration of liberalism into rationalism, or vice versa. But a clear distinction may be made between both, and it is no part of a philosopher's duty to ignore or obscure distinctions. Rationalism as a word never bears a good meaning. Liberalism may mean something good or something bad. There are no orthodox rationalists, but there may be orthodox liberals. It is not easy to state wh wherein the distinction between the two lies, even though we are quite sure that distinction does not lie between them. Perhaps we shall be near the truth if we say that liberalism is a leaning and rationalism is a bent, or that liberalism is a tone of thought and rationalism is a dogma, or that liberalism may be the raw material and rationalism the finished product. A rationalist is one who looks on himself in theory and practice as everywhere free from the bridle of authority. A liberal Catholic is one who merely acts as though free from the limitations of here and now. A rationalist is a high priest and prophet of reason. A liberal Catholic acknowledges himself the student and even the servant of faith. And if the rationalist has no limitation but those of the mind thinking and the object's thought, the liberal Catholic makes light of the limitations or restrictions of time and place. For liberalism not being a dogma but an attitude, the same dogma may today characterize an advanced liberal and tomorrow betoken the most orthodox Catholic. Arianism, Nestorianism, Lutheranism are dogmas or denials subject to no change, but the unsafe liberal Catholic of the 20th century may anathematize his fellow liberal of the 19th. We may deserve a like anathema only by his forgetfulness that to participate is often as dangerous as to delay in that the 20th century must not too hastily take up the methods of the 21st. This leads us to one of the chief elements of liberalism, false and true. A true liberal is a true loyalist, but his loyalty is to the Church's future no less than to its past. He does not look on today as the tomb of yesterday, but as the womb for tomorrow. Though the Church's past is one of splendor, he looks forward to a more splendid future. For him, Christianity is indeed the fulfillment of the promises, but still more is it the bringing of a better hope. Jesus Christ is a midpoint ending and beginning divine promises. The world the church covets most is a world that is to be. Its daily prayer is, Thy kingdom come. Its eyes in apostolic days were not turned back upon an Eden, but forward to a millennium. Thus, the true liberal does not look on Christianity as a crucifixion, though it dies daily, but as a resurrection, for behold, it lives. Nor can he see in the Incarnation merely an episode, but an institution. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. A true liberal does not rest his faith on a dead path. A true liberal does not rest his faith on a dead past, but on a living present, nor on any historical fact, but on an 
in existent reality, nor on an empty tomb, but on a real presence. Sometimes he seems to disregard history, but this is only his human way of saying that the future is almost more to him than the past. He is impatient when a certain class of Catholics boast of their loyalty, whereby expressing a mere sentiment for what has been, as though loyalty like memory was only retrospective. In La Cordaire's strong phrase, he is a citizen of the future, and he bows down before the new era that is to be.